to begin the, the afternoon session, uh, I'd like to introduce you the contributor for this symposium, uh, Dr. Richard Krause of NIH. Uh, with his kind support, we can use this uh, Cosmos Club to hold today's meeting. And he was a director of NIAID, NIH, and senior investigator of NIAID. Now he is the senior scientific advisor of Fogarty International Center of NIH and investigator emeritus of NIAID. I'd like to uh, ask him to say a few words. Yes, thank you very, very much, and welcome to the Cosmos Club. It's uh, very good to have this, uh, this program here. Uh, I've been working with the U.S.-Japan Cooperative Medical Science Program now for many, many years, and we've hosted uh, similar groups such as this every year now for 17 or 18 years. Uh, I'm sorry that I was not here this morning, but I was not goofing off, as we say. I actually was in Ohio, where a long time ago I agreed to sponsor a lecture at my college uh, by uh, a historian a biographer of Isaac Newton. Uh, he's played some role in what we've been discussing here this today. And, uh, uh, and um, the interesting thing about Isaac Newton is, in addition uh, to, of course, the calculus and um, and uh, much else, uh, gravity. We still don't know what that is. But he also was a very much an alchemist and. Um, he wasn't ever really looking for the sorcerer's stone, but was rather uh, very much involved in mixing alkali and acids and so on. Most interesting part of Newton's life. I learned a lot, but I'm not here to talk about that. I'm here to welcome you, but I did want you to know that I didn't just sleep in bed this morning. I was actually <laughs> driving back from Ohio where I had heard this wonderful talk. About, uh, about the work of Isaac Newton. Welcome here. I'm looking forward to these discussions. I suspect uh, you will not hit the mark exactly on when the next disasters are going to happen. I grew up in the Ohio Valley where we had frequent floods. Uh, and when the settlers first settled there in 1786, they settled right at the confluence of the Ohio River and another Ohio River. Right down, right down on 10, two meters above the water. The Indians never camped there. The Indians were up on a campground on a mountain. The Indians told the settlers, don't camp down right by the river because it will flood. They didn't believe them. And of course, we've had a flood every 10 years for the last 200 years. And the Indians were right and we were wrong. And uh, finally, some people have gone up and lived up on the high land where the Indians had the good sense to camp out. So that's a story of risk and risk management, and it still resonates today. Good to have you all here. Thank you very much, Dr. Krause. Now, I'd like to ask Dr. von Hipper to lead the second session. Well, this, this session is, is on reactor safety and the consequences of the Fukushima accident. We have three excellent speakers. Uh, Richard Reserve, uh, who's the uh, president of the Carnegie Institution, uh, was, was the uh, chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and has just come back from, uh, I guess, 10 days ago from testifying uh, uh, before two uh, uh, commissions in Tokyo uh, investigating the Fukushima accident. Uh, Richard Garwin, who uh, has uh, for the last 50 years been on every advisory committee that matters and was including, I, I guess, the, uh, the committee that the Department of Energy put together to, to see what, how the U.S. could help um, with regard to the uh, 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 the Fukushima accident early on. And uh, Professor Niwa, 
uh, who is uh, a radiation uh, biologist and a member of the Inter uh, International Commission on Radiation Protection and has, has been turned uh, by the Fukushima accident into a, uh, an, a public educator on, on trying to explain to the public uh, the, the risks of radiation and, and uh, that they're not about, all about to die. Uh, so I, I, each speaker will speak uh, for about 25 minutes and there'll be flags uh, flagging them down uh, as they get toward their time limit and then we'll have a discussion uh, at the end of that. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really pleased to have opportunity to join you today. And it's always, always nice for me to have a, be here with a session chaired by Frank von Hippel. He may not remember this, but when I was a first year graduate student in the Department of Applied Physics at Stanford, he taught the electricity and magnetism course that I took. Uh, and he may not remember it. And, uh, I do recall, I think it was the first time he had taught, but that was, it was an interesting experience, I think, for both of us. As Frank indicated, I have recently returned from uh, Japan. I had been invited by the Japanese government to go and to be an international expert to uh, interact with the Hatamura Commission, which is the one that the former prime minister had established to investigate the Fukushima accident. Uh, and then, as it happened, I was also invited by uh, Professor Kurokawa, who was chairing the commission that was established by the Diet as another group that is investigating the accident. And so I had, uh, was there for several days, uh, two days with each of the commissions, and I also had an opportunity to uh, go to Fukushima and tour the site as well. Uh, I'm not going to talk about some of the many engineering lessons that are, should be learned from the Fukushima accident. There's a lot of activity that regulators around the world are undertaking to deal with the accident. Uh, in my view, there are some more fundamental lessons that need to be learned uh, to be able to deal with the situation in Japan. Uh, and so I'm going to focus on those. Let me say at the outset that the investigations by these two commissions are still underway. What I know is what they have told me and what I've read uh, about the accident. I don't know all the facts. There are many facts that remain to be, uh, to be explored. And so uh, take what I say with that understanding. And I also want to emphasize that I have no role in trying to cast blame on anybody. I think it's important that you confront these matters <coughs> accurately and as factually as you can. Take, go where the facts lead you, uh, but it isn't with any intention on my part to assess responsibility. But uh, as I've indicated, I think there are some very fundamental issues that need to be addressed uh, as a result of this accident. You know, there is a whole hierarchy of uh, standards that are promulgated by the International Atomic Energy Agency. And at the very top of the hierarchy is a document that's a rather simple document. It's called the Fundamental Safety Principles. And it lays out sort of 10 principles that cover all nuclear activities. And below that are requirements and guides and so forth that are much more extensive. The very first principle that is argued by the International Atomic Energy Agency is that the operator has the principal responsibility for safety. It is the operator that has to put safety above all else. Uh, and one of the questions that I think needs to be asked is whether regulatory compliance is sufficient to discharge that safety issue. It's my view it is not. There has to be, there is a need and a responsibility for the operator to step to the plate and look at issues and resolve them regardless of whether they're required by regulation or not. And I think there's some serious questions as a result of this accident as to whether TEPCO had understood that as its responsibility and fulfilled it. The second principle 
that is defined by the IEA is the role of the regulator. That's not to diminish the responsibility of the operator, but rather to emphasize that the regulator has a very important role as the backstop to the operator in the fulfillment of the obligations. When I'm saying operator, I should be clear, I'm not talking about the people in the control room, I'm talking about the owner of the plant. Um, and it is, I think, my view that there are several, and the IEAs, that there are several important characteristics that are essential to be found in the regulator. One of them uh, that I think is important to recognize is the scope of the responsibility. It is something that's really actually been emerging over time, but that that responsibility should cover safety, security, radiation protection, and aspects of safeguards. And the reason I say that is that there are issues that arise in each of those areas that affect the other areas. And you need to have a regulator that sees the whole picture and can assemble and analyze the situation and achieve the right balance. Let me give a simple example. From the safety point of view, you would like to have lots of means of access and egress from the plant. So if there was an accident, you'd have a capacity to get the people out and to get the fire trucks in. From the security point of view, you'd like to have the access go through a highly channeled area, preferably a single access point that is tightly controlled. Uh, and so you have a clear example there of where what safety would tell you to do is going to be inconsistent with what a security perspective would justify. And there are similar uh, aspects, of course, radiation protection has to be built into both components of the activity, both safety and security, and there are obviously safeguards, implications of what goes on uh, in nuclear facilities. So uh, the scope should encompass all. One of the important characteristics, and this is heavily emphasized by the IEA, is the need for independence. The regulator should be free from political or licensee interference. It should do its job as it sees fit without there being any suppression or control of its activities. This was something that was recognized in the United States in 1975. Before that time, there was something called the Atomic Energy Commission. And it had within it both the responsibility for regulation of nuclear power and a promotional and development role for nuclear power. The Congress recognized that those were inconsistent with each other. And it separated the Atomic Energy Commission with the regulatory component going off to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the remainder going off into what eventually became the Department of Energy. Uh, and the, the regulator was set up as an independent agency of government. The NRC does not report to anyone other than perhaps in a very uh, theoretical sense to the president. But it is completely independent of all of the, uh, any political influence that could be exerted as a result of it being a subsidiary, or subservient to another agency in government. You have an obvious problem that the Japanese have recognized that NISA, the regulator in Japan, was and is a part of many. Ministry for Economic Trade and Industry, which has a clear promotional role uh, for uh, the development of nuclear power and of other activities that affect the economy. And the regulator was embedded in an organization that basically was trying to serve the licensee's interests. So there is contemplated within the Japanese system that the regulator will be moved. There is proposed legislation that wouldn't make it purely independent, that would make it move it to the Ministry of the Environment. And I'm not sufficiently expert with what is possible within the Japanese legal structure as to whether that's sufficient independence, that's something the Japanese need to evaluate, but the, the objective should be to create an independent agency. The agency obviously should have the legal authority to be able to fulfill its responsibilities. It needs to have adequate financing and staff. And it goes without saying that that's a capability that has to exist. At the moment, that is tied in with the independence issue because all the funding and staffing for the, for the regulatory agency today is controlled by the ministry. I think 
one important factor that was revealed by the accident is the need for competence in the regulators. Uh, the way NISA worked, as I understand it, is that the means for sort of development of personnel within Medi was as part of a sort of tour of duty. Various managerial people would move into the regulatory organization for a year or two, and then move on. And they may have no necessary technical experience as they move into those jobs, and they never really <laughs> develop them. As soon as they know something about the job, they moved on to another one. <laughs> so you had a regulator that did not have the technical capabilities it should have had. And that's revealed <clears throat> by the accident itself in terms of the contribution that Medi was able to provide. Fortunately, there's some water right here. I mean, <laughs> take advantage of it. By contrast, and I don't mean to say the NRC is perfect, but they're a career staff. Yeah. They are people who will spend their entire professional careers in government there. They're comparatively well paid because there's an opportunity for bonuses at the NRC in light of their background and skills. And, uh, and it is a place where people want to spend their careers. That for a number of years, the NRC has been voted by employees across the government as the number one or number two best place in government in which to work. I tell that to people in Japan and they're staunch. They can't imagine that that could be the experience of somebody in a regulatory organization. But it is, in fact, what the polling of federal employees would show. Another very important characteristic, and one which I think is essential for the Japanese now, is openness and transparency. Anything that happens behind closed doors is likely to raise suspicions, and I think that's unfortunately particularly a characteristic in the nuclear field. And so it is a vital ingredient of an effective regulator to have people see what decisions are being made, on what basis they're being made, how they're being made. So it has to, transparency is an important element of assuring people that the agency is making reasoned decisions on a reasonable basis and that the facts are all explored. People may not like the decisions, but at least they can see how they're made. They can have some confidence in them. And beyond that, there is a need to engage stakeholders, that people who are affected by nuclear activities should have the right to participate in the decisions in some fashion. And again, I would point you to the NRC experience, which has extensive efforts to open this. You can go to the NRC webpage, and you will find the entire docket file of all the ex uh, exchanges between the NRC staff and the licensees. All the decisions, the decision documents, the votes, uh, the final resolution are all in documents that are available to the public with the sole exception of those matters that have a proprietary content or raise a security element to them, which are tried, great effort is made to keep those as narrow as possible. So there is an important effort for openness and transparency that, based on what I, conversations I had in Japan, is not a part of the regulatory process today. And finally, I think, as an element of how to do regulation, there has to be a understanding that the focus, priorities, should be established by consideration of risk. That there are lots of things that one could spend time on. And if you're going to allocate your time and your money effectively, risk should be a guiding criterion for how you <coughs> undertake that activity. Uh, in the case of the NRC, for example, there is a whole, the whole inspection program, whole enforcement program, is driven by risk considerations. You examine, inspect, and you, if necessary, impose penalties of various sorts based on the risk significance of any failures that you find. There is also an effort to rethink the regulatory requirements as appropriate, using risk as a consideration to decide what you change and why, and you can soften or strengthen regulatory requirements, but guided by risk considerations. Let me say that the capacity to do that is very tightly connected to competence in staff. You need to know 
something about the technology to be able to make those judgments. And unfortunately, we had a regulator that may not have had the skill sets that were necessary. It was easy to rely on whether the proper papers were filed and the bread boxes were checked and the right signatures were, were in place, rather than considering what was important to ensure safety. So I think that there's a whole series of elements of regulatory capability that are ones that are very important to produce. Another factor that I think is unfortunately rather starkly revealed by the Fukushima accident is the failure to have a chain of command in decision making. Um, as I understand it, nearly every issue eventually was brought to the Prime Minister for decision. The Prime Minister, according to the Hatamura report, the Prime Minister made a decision that it was premature to inject water into one of the reactors and instructed the reactor, the, the plant manager, to stop injecting the water. In a rather remarkable, to me, element of the story, the plant manager was on a conference call in the Prime Minister's office, called over one of his staff and said to the staff member, I'm going to order you to stop injecting water and I want you to ignore me. He then loudly spoke on the speakerphone that he gave, he gave the order to stop injecting water and fortunately the staff understood the private word that had been spoken and they continued. So you have a situation that there should be a couple of aspects of the chain of command that I believe were violated as a result of the Fukushima accident. First of all, there should be a delineation of the responsibilities of the operator from the regulator. It is inconceivable to me in the United States that the NRC would be instructing the operator what, how to actually, what valves to turn, what, what, what steps to take. You'd be monitoring, you'd be consulting, and if something was really going bad, you might have to issue an order. But the responsibility would remain with the operator throughout. And beyond that, there would be a delegation of authority so that those making the decisions, the appropriate decisions, would have both the information they needed, which was one of the big problems that the Japanese confronted, and have the competence to make the decision. That as you rise up the hierarchy, that does not necessarily mean that the people at the top have higher, greater skills or knowledge of the specific matter that has to be decided than people who are lower down. You should have a plan in place as to who has what responsibility, what the their authority is, and, and follow the plan, which was yet a third problem in Japan, where they did whatever plan they had was one that was ignored. Perhaps the most critical element, however, of the discussions that were revealed by my interaction with the two commissions in, in, in Japan was the need to establish a safety culture that was an aspect of the entire nuclear industry. By that I mean to have as a culture that safety is the highest priority. And it comes ahead of schedule, it comes ahead of cost, it comes ahead of productivity, that it is something that is the guiding principle, is the first thing that you assure is being adequately taken care of. And that there are traits that are associated with making that real. It's very hard to determine whether that a culture is in place. But some of the traits are a management that recognizes that this is its responsibility and demonstrates through its decision making so that all employees see that safety is coming first. It explains this, rewards people on terms of their compliance with this requirement. And beyond that, the inculcation of individual responsibility so that everyone in the plant understands that it is his or her responsibility to assure safety. And if that person sees something that they think is a problem, it is their obligation to do something about it. And if they see a problem, they should tell it to their supervisor. If their supervisor does nothing, and after a conversation determines why the person still thinks it's a problem, it's that person's obligation to go above the supervisor and to make sure the issue is addressed. And to have in place, as a regulatory requirement, that there can be no retaliation against an employee who undertakes those steps. 
I can assure you at the NRC that this is actually one of the things that can really get an operator in trouble, is that if an employee has raised a safety concern and has been punished for some reason as a result, that is the kind of violation which the NRC takes very seriously and will, <coughs> will intrude and will be, substantial, will be a substantial violation and a, and a fine that would be incurred in that situation. So I, I recognize there are some cultural issues that are raised here. My Japanese friends would say that. That there is sort of a, one of them said to me that the, one of the words in Japan is that the nail that sticks up gets hammered down. And you just can't run a nuclear plant that way. Everyone has to see it as his responsibility to be one that stands out from the crowd if necessary to address the issues. And if the balance is nuclear safety versus culture, Culture has to change. It's that simple. Well, um, you know, we had an accident in 1979 in the United States. It was a Three Mile Island accident. We were very fortunate in that the containment held, and there were no releases of radioactivity above regulatory limits. There were a lot of changes that the uh, U.S. made as a result, a very significant regulatory changes. There was a lot of thought put into restructuring authority within the agency to improve the capacity to deal with emergencies. I think all of those things were important. But in retrospect, I think the most important thing that happened out of Fremont Island is that the owners, the operators of the plant, took responsibility. They realized it was in their self-interest to assure that all plants were operated safely. And they created something called the Institute for Nuclear Power Operations, which is headquartered in Atlanta. And it strives to achieve excellence in plant operations. And uh, let me say that it's real. They do very stringent inspections of plants. If there is a problem at a plant, the CEO of that operation is embarrassed in a public meeting with all the other CEOs in the room, and that's all who's there. And they're required to stand up and explain how they got themselves in trouble and how they fixed it. And I can tell you, there's a personal incentive that every one of them feels that they never want to be in that position. Uh, and they, uh, there is, uh, you know, there's insurance, there's all kinds of other incentives that are that surround the INPO ratings, and that if you're a poor performing point plant from the INPO perspective, you pay more for your insurance. So there's a financial incentive that's provided. But the point I'm trying to make is that as a result of Three Mile Island, the owner operators themselves realized that they had a responsibility to take this issue seriously and to do something about it. And I hope that is something that occurs widely in Japan. So I don't mean by this, as I say again, to say that the United States is perfect. There are many people who have challenged various aspects of what the NRC does, and in my view, uh, with some justification in many cases. Uh, but I do think there are some fundamental issues that need to be addressed in Japan. And they relate to really the very foundations for success in nuclear performance. And I very much hope the Japanese will find a way to learn from this accident and to become better, just as I believe we did in the United States as a result of the events in 1979. Thank you. talk to you. I've uh, provided the text of my talk here, not all of which I will read, uh, and highlighted some things that I think are important. So you see here on the left uh, my website where I post lots of papers, including uh, this one. And on the right, a website where there's a magic search box. 
So if you just put in there Fukushima or missile defense or whatever, you will search all the papers on the left. And uh, you might even find out how to do that on your own. So civil nuclear power can be a miraculous gift to society, and it produces now only 13%. You know, a couple of years ago, it was almost 20%, but we've been building electrical capacity and not very many reactors. And 52 or 54 reactors in Japan are not producing power right now, so we've lost ground. But nuclear power can also be a curse. Questions of safety and proliferation have been recognized from the very beginning, and more recently, security of the nuclear power sector has become a recognized problem. Uh, to keep it, keep it safe from uh, intentional catalytic harm. So, as for my abstract, I propose that current organizations, such as the Institute of Nuclear Power Operations, INPO in the United States, and WANO for the world, be strengthened to carry out and to lead the way on detailed analyses of potential events and hazards in the nuclear power sector, including a frank evaluation of the societal costs of exposure of societies to relatively low doses of radioactive materials that could be disseminated in reactor accidents. And especially, I propose that IAEA be given the responsibility and resources to certify and monitor mined and geologic repositories and the packaged waste forms to be shipped there, spent fuel and other waste, to enable the creation of competitive commercial repositories available to all members of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. So I've worked uh, in nuclear power and other things for a long time. And uh, in the energy sector, I uh, chaired the National Academies Committee on the Solar Energy Research Institute and published in 1977-79 a number of papers on the proper role of the breeder reactors. And as Franklin Hippel indicated, I was a participant in the report to the American Physical Society by the, of the study group on light water reactor safety, and a couple more uh, books in the next few years. In recent decades, I published with uh, Georges Sharpak a number of books on uh, nuclear power and nuclear weapons, megawatts and megatons, and in 2005, a book uh, in French, De Chernobyl on Chernobyl, that is from one Chernobyl accidents to unfortunately the prospect of many of them, and uh, it will be reissued this year, updated perhaps with the title uh, from Chernobyl to Fukushima Daiichi. In preparing this talk, I was fortunate to have the benefit of the Blue Ribbon Commission report on America's nuclear future, uh, published just uh, two months ago, and especially the International <coughs> Panel on Physical <coughs> Materials uh, that uh, Franklin Hippel has created. September 2011 report managing spent fuel from nuclear power reactors, experience and lessons from around the world. I and my co-authors have argued that the acceptability of the nuclear power enterprise depends on competent and honest analysis and presentation of the risks, and in particular on the choice and progress toward sufficient operating mine and geological repository capacity for spent fuel from existing nuclear power reactors as well as from future power reactors. This is a tendentious problem because of the long live radioactive material present in nuclear reactors and in the fuel cycle, especially in the spent fuel pools at the reactor sites, and the consequences of distributing some of this material into the atmosphere, or more generally the biosphere, by accident or intentional destruction. So I'm not going to talk about security of reactors and fuel cycle, especially reprocessing plants, which is a very important topic, but not ours here. Unfortunately, in both the commercial and the government sector, risk management priorities often come down to managing public perceptions about prospects and events. As evidenced by emails in several countries following Fukushima Daiichi, in which officials argue that their priority is to maintain the nuclear power sector in a good light, even before those officials knew of the facts in regard to the disaster. Only by addressing directly the analysis of independent groups, some of them extremely competent and fair, others as biased as government sponsors of nuclear power themselves, can public confidence be achieved. You can't just ignore 
uh, competent critics. This assessment has two aspects, the fault tree and event tree, the uh, detailed analysis and assessment of the probability of various accidents and an evaluation of their consequences on the health, on health and the economy. There is in the nuclear power sector a widespread reluctance to address objectively the question of potential injury from low-dose exposure to radiation, despite responsible reports like that of uh, the National Academy of Sciences, Board on Effects of Ionizing Radiation, Year 7, that assess the incidence of lethal cancers in the adult population as above 0.05 per person sievert, and a total incidence of cancer of above 0.1 per, per person sievert. So, 20 sieverts, one expected death from cancer. 10 sieverts, one expected case of cancer from the radiation. Some fragmentary analyses of the health effects of Fukushima Daiichi have been made, for instance, by the French Institute of Radio Protection and Nuclear Safety, IRSN, on various assumptions as to evacuation of areas beyond the presently defined exclusion regions. And I pre provide here my own assessment on the same basis <coughs> of their numbers. I begin with table two of their report of May 16 that I'll show you in a minute. And they wrote, the external collective dose received over four years by the population of 270,000 people in Chernobyl was 7,300 person sieverts. And the projected external collective dose over four years for the 70,000 people in Fukushima is 4,400 person sieverts. Therefore, without evacuation during the four years after the accident, the radiological consequence of the Fukushima accident from external exposure would reach 60% that of Chernobyl and could be in the same order of magnitude. So I've already mentioned the dose response coefficient of Beer 7 of 0.05 lethal cancers per person sievert. The Fukushima accident, according to those numbers, uh, would lead to 220 deaths from cancer for a population in which one expects some 14,000 people to die of cancer from other causes. But the Chernobyl Forum, not my favorite analysis, report of September 2005 states a lifetime expo exposure of 60,000 person sieverts, not 7,300, and a corresponding toll from cancer from the Chernobyl accident of 4,000 deaths. Had the forum <coughs> included the full 600,000 person sieverts documented by the 1993 UNSCARE report, the corresponding expectation of cancer deaths would be 40,000. And my own estimate with George Sharpback has been about 30,000. Here is the uh, French IRSN uh, uh, recounting of the external doses, at least as uh, analyzed by the Japanese. And uh, the external dose at 10 years is related to the mega becquerel per square meter uh, by 70 millisieverts per mega becquerel per square meter. And uh, over 70 years, it's 2.1 times as large, 160 millisieverts, and so on. So the 69,000, 70,000 that were mentioned previously is this number. And uh, here are the components of the exposure, but that ignores 292,000 additional people who certainly have doses well above background, uh, but less than taken into account here. That report concludes with the following paragraphs. These dose levels do not take into account other exposure pathways, such as immersion within the plume and internal contamination resulting from inhalation of particles in the plume, as well as internal doses already received or to be received from contaminated food ingestion. And the total effective doses could be increased considerably. So uh, I then do some analyses I'm not going to uh, go into here. And uh, the uh, IRSN you know, lauds the Japanese response uh, by saying this policy for preventing the risk of developing long-term leukemia and radiation-induced cancer had been clearly understood by Japanese authorities as shown in the map of population evacuation beyond the initial zone of exclusion of 20 kilometers. 
that is, hot spots of deposition of radioactive materials have also uh, been subject to evacuation. But the results of the IRSN study and the expected consequences in cancer deaths are much underestimated from their own numbers. The citation uh, above indicates that the dose projected to four years is 4,400 per sieverts. The dose in 10 years would be about 9,000, and according to the table, the dose uh, in, in 70 years, lifetime dose, would be 19,000 per sieverts. In addition, one needs to take into account the rest of the 292,000 people who have been ignored here. Doing that will amount actually not to 21,000 person sieverts, but 30,000 person sieverts. I have to fix that. And so that's about 1,500 <coughs> cancers expected. An equal number of cancers are to be expected which will be survived thanks to surgical treatment or chemotherapy. These estimates don't take into account the internal dose from food. Uh, my conclusion, though, is different from those who are unwilling to accept the multiplication of these two numbers, the dose response coefficient of 0.05 lethal cancer uh, per person sievert and the collective radiation dose. My conclusion is that society must understand that some negative influence on the population always exists, whether in the cost of the technology or in the consequence of technology. And this must be compared with the benefits of those technologies. So if the probability of such an accident can be maintained acceptably low, so as not to eliminate much of the benefit of energy production from nuclear power, then even these major disasters should be acceptable. And that was the conclusion of our 1979 book, uh, Nuclear Power Issues and Choices. It's important, however, in considering mandatory or even voluntary evacuation to take into account the potential hazards, even health hazards, associated with the disruption of normal life. If this were the equivalent of 1% loss of life from cancer, it would indicate that evacuation would be harmful rather than beneficial for avoided doses of 200 millisieverts or less. Societal damage or compensation for those not evacuated <coughs> could be based on estimated individual dose with my assumed 0.05 lethal cancer per person sievert and a nominal $5 million value per premature death averted. This would correspond to compensation of 0.25 million per person sievert. For those evacuated under the arbitrary assumption of 1% equivalent loss of life from evacuation, the compensation might be $50,000 per evacuee plus an amount similarly proportional to the dose as with those who are not evacuated. So in the case of Fukushima Daiichi, compensation for not evacuating 292,000 people, less than 82 millisieverts each, would be less than $21,000 each, or $6 million. That such compensation can be provided fairly is demonstrated by the performance of Kenneth Feinberg in administering such funds for victims of the World Trade Center attack and the BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Now, what stands in the way of what I think is a very sensible policy? Well, I have correspondence with the IAEA about the intentionally misleading report of the Chernobyl Forum, where the responsible official in public relations is quoted in a Nature magazine article as uh, the press officer working at the IAEA uh, in Vienna. I was sick of seeing wild figures being reported by reputable organizations that were attributed to the United Nations, she says. It was a bold action to put out a new figure that was much less than conventional wisdom. The figure had been removed from the final summary, however, published this month, according to the Nature article. Closer to our topic here, and uh, Dick Meserve talked about this, and they uh, translated into French, we have the entire report by Anne McLaughlin of a 2003 session of the World Association of Nuclear Operators. And in particular, I quote here the statement of uh, Tsunehisa Katsumata, president of TEPCO, that TEPCO's nuclear power division had become a homogeneous and exclusive circle of engineers who divide checks by other divisions, defined, including the management. Rules covering fitness for service of equipment were not clear, he said, and didn't allow for flaws as equipment aged. 
encouraging personnel to ignore the rules. Media attacks on problems at nuclear facilities put the engineers on the defensive, encouraged them to hide faults as long as they didn't immediately threaten safety, leading to 16 cases of falsification of inspection and repair records of TEPCO's BWRs. And uh, it goes on. Stable supply of electricity was the ultimate objective, leading them to make personal decisions based on their own idea of safety. Contrary to the code of safety that uh, Dr. Meserve mentioned, which our licensees in the United States do not always follow either, nor does our Nuclear Regulatory Commission follow up, in my opinion, properly on uh, fire uh, improvements that have not been made and on famous problems such as the davis bessey uh, corrosion hole in the reactor pressure head. Uh, the president of uh, TEPCO said in 2003, multiple incidents up to and including the latest episode at TEPCO have severely eroded the Japanese public's trust and the country's basic culture still discourages whistleblowing. Some ascribe this deplorable status to the profit motive, but I think it's no less widespread among government officials and employees who, trying to do their job, have no time or patience to understand problems with the technology or investments that they are working so hard to implement. Now, looking ahead to the spent fuel problem, that's addressed at length in the International Panel on Fissile Materials Managing Spent Fuel Report and more briefly in the Blue Ribbon Commission report. Uh, the IPFM report is particularly useful here in its extensive description of various national programs, only two of which are well along uh, Sweden and Finland. It documents the fact that the concept of an international repository <coughs> is far from new, but it has had little traction and suggests that the best approach is to add an international aspect or sector, perhaps, to a major national repository. Given that almost all of the Earth's land surface, except Antarctica, which by treaty and custom is prevented from being a repository, belongs to one country or another, there's a certain logic behind the international spent fuel repository deriving from a national one. But there's no large scale repository for it to be derived from. And in any case, it would have to be acceptable to the host state. So I think that the concept of an international spent fuel repository should, as a profitable enterprise, drive that for a national spent fuel repository. And there should be several. IAEA has not objected to the suggestion that it be a regulator and inspector for such activities. But of course, it's only an information gathering and disseminating organization, and it would have to be buttressed by UN forces or commitments from IAEA member states, UN member states, to provide force if necessary to prevent or repel intrusions on the International Spent Fuel Repository or its operation. An international group of investors, including states themselves, could provide the commercial entity that would design, site, and manage the International Spent Fuel Repository, which would evidently be a massive undertaking. Its purpose would be profit, but profit from operations in a very limited field. An alternative to siting on land would be technically to have an ISFR mined in the seabed on the abyssal plain that at a depth of five kilometer underlines, underlies most of the open ocean. So this is rejected by various treaties, uh, but it ought to be looked at. Again, we know a lot more about such things than we did in the 1970s. Although I and my colleagues have long advocated international repositories, they've been banned by custom and national law. But the Council of Europe last July, as noted in the IPFM report, specifically authorized European states to share repositories and even to contract with a third non-EU state to have a joint repository. Clearly, there are many obstacles, not the least of which is the long-term nature of the work and the limited profit, even if beyond the cost of spent fuel de de uh, disposition of the order of a tenth of a cent per kilowatt hour, uh, when charged more in order to make more profit up to a cent per kilowatt hour, there would still be a limited profit, only about $24 billion annual, annual cash flow uh, to handle the disposition of spent fuel. 
And the Apple Corporation stock value is now $500 billion. So investors would much rather bet on another Apple than on this long-term and pretty sure prospect of uh, $10 per megawatt hour uh, cash flow for spent fuel disposal sector. So the initiative would likely come from a country that has a large existing population of reactors and also plans for a major nuclear power sector in the future. The United States and Russia are two, and China, despite its small current nuclear sector, certainly fits this description. All three have large land areas. The reports uh, on spent fuel repositories uh, <coughs> emphasize that Sweden and Finland have used consent-based approach to siting of facilities, a concept outstanding for its good sense rather than its novelty. Citing several competing ISFR on the seabed would solve some problems and pose others. Technical problems, for instance, of mining and other operations at great depth, far beyond the two kilometer depth of deep water horizon well in the Gulf of Mexico. Evidently, the entire operation on the seabed would have to be performed remotely, and much of that operation would be essentially no vision through the seawater in view of the mud that would be created by the boring machines. Choices would need to be made about the storage casts. They would not have to withstand potential kilometers, kilometers depth of glaciation that we're going to suffer here on land in the open ocean, but they would need to survive the pressure of seawater at depth, 500 bar, 7,000 pounds per square inch at five, five kilometer depth. The daunting problem remains that of maintaining security for 100 millennia or more that would be eased by an all thorium fuel cycle, but that would do nothing for the existing reactor fuel or for the decades before uranium fission fuel might be phased out, if ever. I've long called for a world, world breeder laboratory that would develop calculation and simulation tools and experimental programs for validating them. After some decades of operation of this laboratory, if much advanced analysis showed the opportunity for a breeder reactor that was safer than light water reactors and competitive with them, one might build a single one of several candidate classes of breeders. The same or a different world laboratory could be devoted to analysis of various options for an international spent fuel repository, building on the analysis that has been done thus far in the national programs. And I should add on the emerging consensus that uh, dry cask storage for 100 years or more is uh, probably favorable, even if one has a repository available as a matter of economics and safety to unload these overcrowded spent fuel pools. Overhanging all this is the question of future support for the security and tending of the repositories after fission power has been replaced by fusion or other advanced and uh, potentially less hazardous technology. And through the glacial eras that are sure to come, will humanity give the necessary attention to the safety and security of a spent fuel repository? Well, we have to do something with our existing fuel, whatever the future of nuclear power. So uh, we must do the best we can uh, with open discussion and decision. Thank you. is uh, completely different from uh, the talks uh, are going on today. That is, uh, I'm taking a kind of bottom-up approach on how to tackle the, uh, the, 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 the after accident life in Fukushima. And so what I have is ICRP criteria of emergency to existing situation, that's one thing and science behind the criteria and a bit of Fukushima data uh, that is actual radiation dose and the idea behind the ICRP cr criteria and how to move forward and uh, those are the, uh, the so one thing 
Uh, this morning, especially, we learned much about tsunami and big disaster. Uh, it's so clear that these big disaster is something happens, and you just uh, you just lose everything, and you start from the scratch to build up once again. And but look at this uh, beautiful spring. Uh, field uh, in Fukushima. This is uh, uh, one primary school called uh, Tomi, Tominaga, uh, uh, Tominari uh, Primary School, and beautiful. And there is a few uh, small, uh, like uh, school uh, buildings somewhere here. And uh, it is after the accident, and bad comes. And flowers and everything so nice but people fled and uh, so what what is it and is it really that dangerous it's a big question and I've been studying radiation biology in my life since my graduate <coughs> days and I know that radiation does harm human health dose dependently so when the dose is low risk is low high risk is high very simple and so this is the kind of you know, criteria ICRP uses, and that is uh, when, you know, before the accident, we operate things in a so-called planned exposure situation. For the public exposure limit is one millisievert per year. That's kind of general standard. It's around the range of natural background radiation. So we can reduce this dose as much as possible uh, and uh, it's easy because the radiation source is under the control. But when accident happens, then uh, you cannot control. That's the accident. So first of all, what you have to do is you have to fret from for your you know health risk or something. So for the the criteria, uh, ICRP put was uh, 20 to one. 100 millisievert. If this is a range that's manageable in terms of health risk, and a Japanese system is Japanese government has implemented that you have to evacuate if the dose is above 20, uh, 50, and also you have to be in a house sheltering if the dose is uh, around this range or something. Because this is emergency, so you really have to do things quickly. And then, next one is emergency situation, so-called, and the range of the dose criteria is this, and this, within this one year or so, you just try to reduce the dose as much as possible, so that still this dose, this range of dose is okay. Uh, because of the reason why I be, uh, for, for, for the reason I will be telling you in a minute. And then <clears throat> after this range, after for example reactor just cooled off, and you still don't get rid of the all the debris and the reactivities, and so exposure situation exists. And so the range of the reference level ICRP recommended was one to twenty. And within this range, it's okay. And you can just reborn and just work on reducing the dose by remediation. And long-term objectives will be one millisievert per year. This is a kind of criteria. And the, the reason for these criteria is quite simple. It's, it's based on the health risk, and especially the data comes from Avon survivors. And we, you two, uh, health effect. One is deterministic, and which is like diarrhea, and maybe uh, bleeding from your mouth, or whatever it is. And that's acute tissue reaction thing, and this is deterministic. And this background frequency is around zero. Nobody diarrhea, get diarrhea without any cause. So normal people don't have diarrhea, so background is zero. And induced frequency can be 
uh, as high as 100%, depending on the dose. So if you give more dose, then you, you come down with diarrhea or whatever 100%. And there is threshold, clear threshold dose, and uh, 500 millisievert is a threshold dose for acute exposure. And this is a, so if the dose is below this one, the, the only thing you have to worry about is so-called stochastic effect, that cancer and uh, hereditary effect. And cancer and hereditary effect, we come down with cancer, and we come down with hereditary disease, certain percentage. But fortunately enough, uh, Avon survival data doesn't show any hereditary effect after you know, 56 years, 30 years of investigation. So hereditary effect is out. So only cancer is something we have to worry about. And cancer, you have background. That's for Japanese, 30% of us will be dying from cancer. So that 50% of us will be uh, <coughs> uh, getting cancer in your lifetime. That means you, know, you get twice two cancer in your lifetime uh, maybe 25% of people will get double cancer, and maybe 10% of people triple cancer, something like that. So <clears throat> this is background. Then you have linear increase, and the linear increase can be statistically significant above the dose of 100 millisievert. And below this one, we just make a line because of the uh, the for two reasons. One is science, the other one is for policy, which I'll be discussing later. So this 100 millisievert is uh, the criteria for kind of low dose range, where most of us will be worrying about in, in the case of Fukushima. So Avon survival data and the acute effect, that is a stochastic effect, uh, no, deterministic effect comes with a few weeks, a few months. Then fetal effect, uh, the fetal uh, exposure, uh, exposed people are uh, born with, uh, the only thing you have to worry about is a uh, small brain. So small, a kind of malformation because of the, uh, during the, the neurogenous uh, uh, stage of your fetal development, radiation uh, affect this development and uh, people come down with smaller brain and some uh, mental retardation sometimes. So these are the only thing you have to worry about. Then no genetic effect and leukemia pops up after five years and then it went down and solid cancer becomes uh, became evident when the people became so-called cancer age. So it takes time for these. And then the dose response. So you have background of 30%, then you have almost similar uh, linear increase, and below 100, you really don't know. And then, <clears throat> so the excess relative risk of the cancer is 0 0.47 per one grade, or 1,000 millisievert, and lifetime risk of the cancer is 10% increase by grade, and then linear increase of cancer above 0 0.1, and below 100, we don't know, but really, uh, we assume that is linearly increasing. Okay, and uh, then people say that, okay, linearity, but uh, why we, we don't know exactly below 100? One is statistical trouble, because you have to have larger, much larger number of people to have statistic a significant increase, uh, to be sure. But this is not only the case, but we have heterogeneity of your population. This is Japanese uh, cancer uh, mortality. That is, high cancer mortality prefecture, the, like this, and low cancer mortality prefecture. The difference is 10%. And if this is total cancer, and if you only take liver cancer, the difference is 40%. Quite a wide range heterogeneity. So this heterogeneity just covers up the subtle difference of below 100 millisieverts. 
That is something you have to keep in mind. And also, famous one is lifetime risk of cancer and Asian exposure. Fetus is supposed to be very sensitive, but recent uh, studies have shown that fetus is uh, maybe sensitivity of fetus is similar to childhood exposure or less. So you don't have to worry, but childhood exposure is just about, you can say that it's twice as high risk. Uh, than adult exposure. That's one thing. And another big data coming out is uh, Chernobyl. And Chernobyl, a uh, report uh, was made in, by Unsquare in 2008. And uh, their conclusion was uh, like, uh, so the liquidator got this much of Mercibel, it ranges from 50 to 5,000, quite a substantial dose, and evacuee of 115,000 got 31 mercibel, and three countries of uh, 6 million got 9 mercibel, and three countries low dose range of 9 or almost like 10 million people got 1.3, and entire Europe got this one. So if you can just uh, do the calculation uh, based on the, the, this monthly world kind that uh, Gawain has done, Dr. Gawain has done, you can just come up to whatever the do, uh, death. That is kind of the number which you have to deal with when you make policy. But if it is real science coming to like uh, laboratory science, uh, 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 like the one I've been doing. This is uh, just a number. We don't know whether this is true or not. So then the conclusion of Unsquare is the key data death by acute radiation syndrome. It was very significant. And increase in cataract and respir respiratory disease disorders, that's quite evident, but not clear for occurrence of leukemia. There are a number of papers showing leukemia has increased. There are a number of papers not increased, and so it's, it's still in between. So Asquia is not clearly saying that. And inhabitant thyroid cancer was quite clear, 6,000, and then no other health effect confirmed. One, some papers say breast cancer, some papers say leukemia, and other papers say it's opposite. And so confirming the conclusion of previous report, and also warning the use of corrective dose for the risk projection of the population with very low dose. And so it's okay to do this kind of calculation, but this is to make policy. And uh, we don't know whether this is real or not. So that is a thing uh, Asquare was saying. And so, summary of health effect of low dose radiation. Risk of stochastic effect is proportional to radiation dose, we believe. Risk of stochastic effect is statistically significant at doses above 100 millisieverts. That is clear. Childhood exposure gives higher risk, but no data still showing the risk below 100 millisieverts. This is epidemiology, no data has shown. And fetal exposure, uh, fetal stage is less sensitive to radiation carcinogenesis than childhood exposure. And this is supported by, also by animal data as well. And this is supported by A1 survival data, by the way and then supported by animal data. So as a bi radiation biologist, I uh, believe this is, and also we have good mechan mechanistic explanation for it. And risk of deterministic effect has threshold dose of around 500. This is too simplistic, but uh, we rely on this number for the protection purpose, and not to worry about when the dose is lower. And uh, so, what the real doses are for Fukushima? And that's uh, thyroid doses for children. 
measure are uh, March 24th to March 30th last year, and they don't have <coughs> good measuring uh, tool. And so also they have to be measuring it with uh, you know just as uh, dosimeter, just attach here. But ambient dose is so high. And so they have to find the location where the dose is low. So look around the, the gymnasium, or maybe underground room and something, and find these places and so ask the kid to come one by one and they measure it. And so this is uh, the reason, that, that's the reason why this is micro sievert per hour because of this detector thing. But with this, if it is 0 0.2 micro sievert per hour for one year old kid, that means this kid will have 100 millisievert after that. Uh, so <coughs> then, so this the diagram shows the highest actually was uh, somewhere here and 35 millisievert was the maximum they detected among <coughs> just about over 1,000 people, no, children. And recently, uh, another data uh, came uh, recently, which was measured in April. This is for adults, and some adults got uh, uh, 87 millisieverts or something, and that's higher, but still much lower than for the thyroid cancer to come up. And another thing is adult is insensitive to thyroid cancer induction, so we are kind of relieved. And uh, then internal dose. So this is uh, data produced by a friend of mine. And he just checked, asked actually, uh, this is much more than that. We, see, they have analyzed 100 families, and they asked to donate, uh, uh, to make extra dishes of the household. So I got this uh, dish, three dish, three meal breakfast and lunch and dinner and two days in the concert uh, in a row. Then got mixed it up, and just uh, then measured the dose of cesium and the dose of potassium. This. Green one is potassium, and cesium-137, cesium-138, oh, this one seven, must be seven, shit. <laughs> I made a mistake. Anyhow, uh, potassium dose is always 10 times higher. So that means potassium dose uh, we are getting per year is 0 0.2 millisievert per year from potassium. So that means the dose they are getting is one order uh, smaller than 0 0.2. And actually, uh, Ministry of uh, Health, Labor, and uh, uh, Welfare, MHLW, did calculation. The conclusion is average dose from the internal exposure is 0 0.05 millisievert per year. So compared with the next one, External dose, internal dose in the case of uh, Fukushima is uh, not much. And uh, that's quite a con uh, contrast uh, to Chernobyl case. Chernobyl case, internal exposure is much more than external one. So we, are, we have to only worry about uh, this external uh, dose, which came out uh, recently and uh, from Fukushima Prefecture. And fortunately enough, fortunately enough the dose uh, received uh, by the people is up to maybe this much, five millisievert, and count 97% or something, which that is something which we have believed. And then, idea behind the ICRP criteria, we have, we have this kind of thing, and then, what ICRP says is in all situations, use LNT and nominal uh, risk coefficient. It is 
to, to not to separate people. So low dose to all the way to high dose, we have no line between the people. Also, you are radiation people, you are non-radiation people, you are risky people, non-risky people. Now, no good. That's not a good radiation protection policy. And also, nominal risk, age, sex, rounded up. So you shouldn't be just cutting, chopping up your family by separating kids or separating female or whatever it is. So we you stick to this uh, you know, nominal coefficient. And plant situation, as we said, one millisievert for public and 20 millisievert for the workers. And urgent uh, protection, then those are unknown, then you, sh you do something. Then emergency situation, and uh, this has to be avoided, and we stick to 20 to one, one, uh, 100. And the existing one to twenty, and this as long as you keep this one, we say it's okay. But one other thing is, when it comes to so-called you know emergency situation and then existing situation, what happens is emergency situation, uh, role of authority is one, and they have to decide, especially for the health risk, is at stake, and so decision making. Uh, is on, based on science. Uh, but when it comes to existing situation where people have to start working on their land, their house, and try to re-establish their life, that's people's role. And for that, I think, you know, social risk, societal risk is at stake. That is, you have stigma, discrimination, all kinds of things. And unfortunately, this has been already going on. So marriage engagement broken because you are from Fukushima. Fukushima boys, Fukushima girls, the, the marriage is broken, unfortunately. And Fukushima product is not selling, even though it is below the governmental regulatory limit of the cesium level or anything. So people are so afraid to buy Fukushima product. And people are so afraid, even for the Fukushima people to come. So this is really horrible. But so then decision making is on value, societal value. It's a this, this tool to, to make the decision. And we really have to make uh, people strong. So how to empower people is a big question. So what is the key? The ICRP says something. So this is for the people living in a contaminated land. It says, after all, isn't it true that what most people really want is to continue living their lives and that they are willing and able with some little help, guidance by the expert to, to help make that happen. So as long as people want to keep on living, we are there to help. How to do it? So, do we just teach people? No way. You know, I go there and I say, well, you know, radiation is not, not that dangerous because of so, so and so dose. And they say, the farmer tell me directly, tell me, I don't believe you because some other scientist came and he said, oh, it's very dangerous. You have to fret. So, this is no way. No advice. So do we advise government? Probably not much help, unfortunately. Do we empower people? Yes, but how? For the empowerment of the people only with listening to people, only with empathy with people, and only by establishing solidarity with people, and teach only when they want to listen. And so we need to dialogue. And we've been doing, ICRP is doing small dialogue. And the uh, first dialogue we did uh, last November, Norwegian, two Norwegian came. They talk about SAMI, contaminated, cesium contaminated uh, uh, contamination problem uh, of the uh, uh, reindeer meat. And also Belarusian, the expert on general travel. But unfortunately, in southern Belarus, people are still discriminated from the people of Minsk. Minsk people never come. 
even after 25 years. And so they know exactly, and French and Japanese scientists and local doctors and teachers and local authorities. Second one we did just last, last month. And uh, so that is city and the region, the same people came, local farmers this time. Local producers, doctors and teachers and authorities. And third one we are planning in June on the food. They have to sell Fukushima products. And for that, consumer, especially in Tokyo, these people wants to, you know, would like to buy and how to do it. And it's, it's a big problem. This is a kind of, you know, dialogue seminar picture, which I borrowed. And uh, so this uh, primary school doing this kind of thing. And then, you know, these PTA people are just cleaning up. So they are moving forward. They are willing. These people are kind of target we, 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 we can help. And then another one is, so Co-op Tokyo. Tokyo consumer, and she uh, gave a very interesting talk, consumer trend after the accident, swinging mind of consumers. And then she says, some consumers say, we'd like to help Fukushima, let's buy. And the other one, oh, I'm worried, and I know no Fukushima at all. And how to reconcile, how to, how to, so dialogue is definitely needed between these two, and also producer and consumer all over. Um, how to do it? Kind of difficult, but uh, there's no other way, but the uh, only way to move forward is with dialogue and with empathy and solidarity. Thank you. say something. <laughs> but uh, what I was saying is that I would not evacuate my family uh, with a dose, expected dose, less than 200 millisieverts. I think that the ICRP is overcautious and that <laughs> if, if people really understood the probability of cancer as the only uh, bad effect of radiation exposure, they would agree with me. Now, in order to uh, come to a social consensus on that, one needs to ask, what is the hazard of evacuation? And I can't uh, attest to these numbers, but a month or so ago, I saw a compilation that 500 people had already died from the evacuation of the uh, radiation-contaminated uh, areas from Fukushima, Fukushima Daiichi. Uh, that would not otherwise have died had they remained. And these were people in unfamiliar situations who had heart attacks from things that they would not be doing otherwise. We ought to have more information on that sort of thing to understand what is the hazard of evacuation. Not that I'm, as you can see, trying to conceal any hazards from people, but you have a situation that has to be coped with. I think there should be some compensation from the people who have been responsible for the accidents, whether it's government or, uh, or industry. That's a secondary uh, question. What is important is what the individual and their families should do in evacuating, being evacuated, taking reasonable measures to reduce their exposure. Uh, Steve Winters. I'd like to direct this a question about the NRC and the openness of the documents. Uh, I understand it's a great policy, uh, but I recently, I think this week, went to another presentation about the Fukushima disaster, and one of the speakers was from an NGO that tries to follow the policies of the uh, NRC very closely in their interactions with the uh, industry, in particular this group you mentioned in their uh, the FLEX program they're suggesting. But in any case, 
uh, this um, gentleman from the NGO said that the problem is, though, that the complexity of the documents is such that basically it takes you about $100,000 just to get into the documents. And to do that, then you have to have a very high level specialized law firm to, to work you through them. So the fact that the documents may all be there and may all be open doesn't necessarily make them accessible to anybody except extreme experts. Could you address that question? I'm a little puzzled at the numbers. Um, but let me say that the, the NRC regulations are complex. Uh, the, and they are very technical. Uh, the interactions with the licensees are at a highly technical level. Uh, and so I think it would be a challenge for an ordinary citizen to go in and to be able to understand the dialogue fully. Information is made available. Uh, it's accessible to everyone. But that doesn't mean that everyone's going to understand. Uh, there is a, uh, quite frankly, I don't see, given the nature of what the interaction has to be, I don't, you would want to have, in my view, have the regulator deal with the matters at a very sophisticated level, and you'd hope the licensees are required to respond at that level. Uh, perhaps there could be more done to try to uh, reassure people as to what the subject actually is and what, why it's important. Uh, but uh, that, you know, it, the core of what the interaction is, is available, and it's available on the NRC website. I, I might add that there is some real expertise, there are some real experts in the NGO community who, who can actually uh, deal with these things. So sometimes the uh, NRC is not as open as you would wish. Uh, you know, I, certainly since uh, the uh, 9-11, a, a lot of information which is, is considered uh, sensitive. Uh, you, know, my, uh, you know, even, you know, I had the experience that something which the NRC was insisting was safe, they didn't want to reveal their explanation of why it was safe because it might be useful to terrorists, which is, so seemed to me self-contradictory. Uh, any other comments or questions? Yeah. My name is Larry Cherigino, a management consultant. Uh, this my, my question goes to the issue of, of how to integrate this very strong technical community with uh, the social science issues involved, as we've heard in, from several of the, of the, uh, well, the nuclear physicists, the geophysicists, the biological experts here. And some of the real opportunities for action would appear to be in issues of where to intervene and how to intervene uh, prophylactically in, in various societies around the world, given drastically different social norms and values in Bangladesh versus Tokyo. Uh, and we have not a good mechanism that I can see for doing that, and I don't know what the technical community may be doing to integrate itself with the rather dark arts of the social scientists and, and vagaries of logistical regressions and populations and all these kinds of issues that, that occur when you go down that road. Thoughts? Well, I've had some experience recently, uh, not in this my uh, visit to Japan, um, but I, I re recently served on the Blue Ribbon Commission that was established by the Secretary to deal with issues having to do with the back end of the nuclear fuel cycle. And uh, one of the strong recommendations that the Blue Ribbon Commission came up with, with dealing with a very difficult issue of siting disposal sites or storage sites for uh, nuclear systems was the importance of having a very open consensus-based process. And that if we were to make progress in this, it was a believed and it was conclusion of the group that affected people had to have an opportunity to participate uh, and to try to develop a consensus among those, those who were involved. We have an example of what happens when you don't follow that process, which is in 1987, Congress had declared that Yucca Mountain was to be the disposal site. There was no consensus by the affected community, and that meant there was the site was stigmatized, really. The people of Nevada had, or many of the people of Nevada, felt that they had been 
uh, fingered to be the disposal site for the nation's uh, waste, and they were adamant in their opposition as a result. Whereas I think if it had been a fairer process in the selection of the site, and the people had been invited to be involved in it, that you might well have had a different outcome. There's some experience abroad uh, in uh, Finland uh, and Sweden recently on um, establishing disposal sites where, in fact, through a consensus process, uh, they were able to, uh, to site such facilities. Uh, and in fact, in, I believe it was in Sweden, they paid a bounty to the, to, uh, the community that did not win the disposal site on the basis that as a loser they should be compensated for not having this desirable facility. Uh, experience that seems rather remarkable to an American. So I think, but your basic point is, is that I think we do need to rethink our processes and that there may well be learning from the social sciences about best to engage people. Uh, and that, uh, that there is now experience abroad that says you can get to some different outcomes if you do things in different ways. I might say that what, what uh, Professor Niwa is doing is a model of, of I think, a way to interact for, for specialists to interact with uh, lay people. But the other, the other point I'd like to make add is, is that, in fact, we're all lay people. Uh, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're having, you know, the, the scientific community is, is, is increasingly specialized. And, uh, and so your training does, you know, you, you really have to, uh, uh, learn a lot to uh, to to uh, to participate in the policy debate. Uh, your your training does not, uh, by you know, technical training by itself does not equip you to do that. Thank you very much. I turned very much here towards my eyes for Finnish partnership. Two questions, my may. One technical uh, regarding sheltering. Are there technologies? which allow air purification for indoor environment, either collect for uh, collective shelters or for homes. I was told by friends in Tokyo area that they don't have any, they think of it. So technologies for indoor environment <coughs> for purification to eliminate uh, nuclear type of particle. The second question, do you think we are at the point where we can build, develop a sort of curriculum for schools? So it's different for policy debates. And I'm from Norway, French national president in Norway. It's not that simple neither in Sweden nor in Finland, this aspect. Education, a general curriculum shared, accepted by everyone, and to disseminate this in schools. Are we at the point where we can define such a curriculum of uh, risk management in order to go beyond the media hype or whatever and to uh, in, use whatever technology, social network is less important, but do we have the knowledge today to build up something and to disseminate? This is a good question. Yeah. Uh, in general, if you look at uh, the question of exposure to people indoors, you know, the particulates have largely fallen out outside. It's uh, not not a not a big problem if you have an air purifier. Sure, you turn it on. Uh, as for the gases, uh, they're they're gone in a short time, typically. Uh, so. It's not, not a problem that's worth worrying about, for the most part. The curriculum, I don't know if anybody has, a, has, a, has an answer. Yeah. <laughs> you have an answer? No, no, I had a question. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, we, at Tristan we have, uh, oh yeah, I, I'm using oh, this yeah, microphone, so don't worry. So, I think, you know, uh, uh, I visited uh, Belarus uh, last October and lands that they have, uh, they, they have implemented self-protection policy starting from primary school, so they teach. And also, it's a very practical thing. So you, when you pick up the very major adults, 
They are EUE, UNO, or something like that. Very practical thing. And Japan is now, after this accident, uh, primary school textbook and junior high textbook, mm -hmm. they will be implementing this, uh, you know, how, how radiation works on human health and so forth. And it's okay textbook and better than nothing. Yep. <laughs> Three questions regarding the uh, our government uh, uh, policy or U.S. policy, if it doesn't matter. I uh, I completely agree that the reserve about the uh, responsibility of the operators, but uh, when the scale of disaster uh, is such that uh, it's uh, almost beyond the capability of a single company. Uh, but, uh, there can be a situation, I don't know if, if Fukushima is the last case. There should be a, there can be a situation where uh, government uh, should take some responsibility. Uh, I understand that uh, at the time of uh, 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 Gulf Oil spill, uh, British Petroleum Company alone probably uh, couldn't deal with it. So I think the DOE, uh, the uh, US government, uh, in one way or another, uh, took responsibility. Uh, I don't know how, what was the arrangement, but uh, uh, for nuclear disaster, uh, as uh, uh, in the Fukushima case, uh, I don't know what's, what's the proper level, but uh, there should be some, some standard there. Uh, this is my uh, question to you, first question. The second one, second one. <laughs> I understand you went to uh, Japan and they uh, uh, attended this uh, hearing of uh, Kurokawa Committee. It's uh, established by the, our diet. Now, I don't know the American system, but uh, I'm rather critical of this uh, diet committee because if the diet wants to take the responsibility, the members of the committee should be uh, from the uh, diet members. And I don't understand why they chose non-experts, uh, regular citizens in, uh, in that sense. Um, how is, uh, is it possible for this committee to take responsibility and authority? That I don't understand. And uh, I want to understand. Uh, understand the American situation in such a case where the lawmakers take the responsibility forming their own committee. Uh, uh, that's the second question. I want to hear you. Uh, the third one is uh, about the NRC. I asked uh, a friend of the AAAS uh, on a forum uh, on something. Uh, I asked uh, uh, the current uh, chair, uh, Jasko, uh, about uh, an NRC uh, advice of uh, 50 miles evacuation of uh, American citizens. Uh, it's uh, almost three times uh, bigger than uh, uh, I mean, size. Uh, Japanese regulation, I know, uh, you, you, should, you probably know, it's uh, 30 kilometers. And uh, I asked JASCO that it created a certain, I, I said, uh, uh, large. Uh, Confusion. Well, American citizen uh, obviously is not uh, three times uh, more sensitive to the uh, debate. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, and uh, just answered that there was some dialogue before this uh, uh, announcement was made. And uh, I don't know what sort of uh, 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 dialogue uh, uh, done between the uh, NRC and the uh, uh, Japanese government. But if the Japanese government accepted it, uh, they got some uh, responsibility. Uh, they failed to have some responsibility to the Fukushima people. They are confused. And uh, they started to mistrust the Japanese government. Uh, I want to hear about you on the former university. These are three inputs I want to give you. Let me see, I think there are three interesting and excellent questions, and I'll try to deal with each of them. 
First of all, you asked a question about the government responsibility and the maximum. Um, and let me just describe how that would be handled in the United States. Um, basically, the responsibility inside the fence of the nuclear power plant is the responsibility of the owner operator to deal with the situation, subject to NRC oversight consultation. Um, the responsibility offsite would involve a whole panoply of different organizations, many of them governmental. Um, there is required to be in place an emergency plan that is reviewed and subject to exercises by both the NRC and the Federal Emergency Management Agency, which handles uh, emergency responsibilities of all kind, along with the relevant state and local emergency responsibilities and agencies that are created to deal with those situations. And they allocate responsibilities among them as to who has responsibility for what. And then there are major exercises that occur every two years. There were all parts of this get together. So there's a distribution of responsibility that reflects this, related to this comment I made about a chain of command, in that there was going to be responsibility for what's going on at the plant, which would be the operator subject to NRC jurisdiction off-site, there are some requirements for the operator to have in place as sirens or telephone lines in terms of communication, but all of that is a, uh, in support of basically a governmental plan for response. Um, your, um, I've forgotten the second question. About the diet hearing. Oh, the diet hearing. Yeah, the diet hearing. Um, the, I understood that the Kurokawa Commission, I was told by the Kurokawa Commission, that this was a totally unique uh, uh, event, that the Diet had never previously formed a commission to an examine an event, that this was seen as, uh, perhaps seen by some as an inappropriate activity. Um, it would not be at all surprising in the United States, however, that the Congress of our United States would undertake such an investigation. Um, in fact, there are you know, several hundred studies a year that, the, that well, perhaps hundred, Dick may recall this, where the Congress asks that the given agency fund a study by the National Academies of an issue. Congress decides the study needs to be done and they will ask, because they don't control the money, they will have an agency, to direct an agency to launch a study. And in fact, at this moment, there is a National Academy study on the Fukushima accident that has been launched at the direction of the Congress. And the focus of the study is what are the implications of the Fukushima accident for our governmental system. It's basically, a, 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 it doesn't involve members of Congress. It's a direction by the Congress that there be such a study. And there have been many other commissions that have been directly chartered by the, by the Congress. And there are, in addition, organizations like the Congressional Research uh, Services, the uh, General Accounting Office, which undertake studies at the request of members of Congress uh, as input to them. So I think I'm trying to suggest that what it seemed like a very strange process in, uh, in Japan would not be at all foreign to our government and to the powers that our Congress would exercise. Um, and I can't comment on knowledgeably about the composition of, the, of either the Hadamura Commission, which was formed by the former Prime Minister, or the Kurokawa Commission. It does not have many, neither commission has very many nuclear experts involved in it. Uh, they do have some consultants, I believe. But why they were excluded is a matter that I, I, don't, I, I can't comment on. You raised your third question it had to do with a situation I'm sure many of you knew, that the, uh, in the midst of the accident, the NRC uh, provided basically a notice that US citizens within 50 miles of uh, Fukushima should uh, should be evacuated uh, at the time when the Japanese government did not have a similar decision. Um, 
the all of the transcripts relating to that decision have recently been made publicly available. That uh, as part of this openness process, this was a discussion that was held in the NRC's Emergency Operations Center where all of the discussion was transcribed and uh, in that uh, there's about 3,000 pages, I understand, of transcript that's available of discussions among a variety of experts coming to this decision. Uh, it reflected, as I understand it, I have not reviewed that transcript, uh, it reflected a very fundamental misunderstanding that the NRC uh, believed that the spent fuel pool on Unit 4 uh, was dry and that there was going to be a very major release uh, from Unit 4 as a result of a possible zirconium fire and the uh, uh, release of the uh, uh, inventory of radionuclides were in that spent fuel pool. Uh, that assumption by the NRC as to the status of the water in the pool in Unit 4 turned out to be completely wrong. Uh, and the, the Japanese government at the time believed it to be wrong. Uh, and there may well be, have been inadequate consultation in this matter, but there was a different technical judgment that was made by the NRC as opposed to the Japanese government, and in this instance, the Japanese government was correct about its evaluation of the circumstances. I think in retrospect, it's very unfortunate in terms, I completely understand that at a time of dealing with this accident to have the NRC be giving advice that's different from advice given by the Japanese government was an unfortunate event. Uh, but I believe that from the NRC perspective, they saw what they believed to be an imminent hazard and took, took uh, action as a result. Uh, and it, I'm sure it had uh, created a great deal of difficulty. Maybe I'll just add something on that. Uh, it, uh, I tried to get the, uh, the NRC's dose estimates as, as a function of distance uh, for their hypothetical accidents that they were looking at. And finally, it took a long time. It took about three months. Finally, with the assistance of a senator, was able to get that. And uh, the, the dose at 50 miles that was above the protection, protective action guides in terms of short-term evacuation was thyroid dose. So an alternative could have been to have, you know, people have available potassium iodide for thyroid protection. Uh, the, the other, the other uh, issue, uh, which I think is, is sort of the NR, is, is, is uh, will have problems with this recommendation, is that uh, within 50 miles of US, a number of US nuclear power plants are major cities. Uh, like New York City, and and so that the uh, I don't see any way that the that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission would actually at, uh, uh, recommend uh, uh, evacuation uh, up to 50 miles in, in the case of a, a U.S. nuclear accident. I think it would be much more rational again to have available potassium iodide for the uh, thyroid doses. And then if there was major contamination from cesium-137 that made a long-term habitation problematic, then uh, the, those, those uh, decisions could be made after, after the, uh, uh, the, you know, the contamination occurred. There would be time. I don't know, do you disagree with that? No, okay. Uh, any, uh, oh, back there. Um, my name is uh, Neil Naito, I was the Director of Public Health for the Navy at that time. And I think one of the key issues that the panel brings up is, is again, this is a difficult issue to communicate to the public just because of the nomenclature and things like that. I mean, I, I spent uh, 24 hour days just writing up various risk communication uh, publications for the Navy and the rest of the military uh, to give to our uh, civilian dependent population over there. And so one of the things that, that the lessons we learned, and again, something that is always learned a lot, is that voluntary evacuation is a really nice option when you're not really sure in a fast moving situation like this, that you give people the option that we're not really sure, but if you, know, you want to evacuate, you know, you can. And I think that has gone a long way uh, to the trust issue. You're not really sure 
that there are other options between you know mandatory eva evacuation and staying in place. And, and it's just in this situation, information was coming so fast at that time, we really didn't know. And so again, we had a whole range of dependents there from you know uh, pregnant women to young kids to you know adults, and, and everybody makes their own different risk calculation depending on the information they get. And so again, you, you try to offer the widest range of, of I think, options, and voluntary evacuation worked real well for us, I think. Um, we probably had, I think, about eight to 10,000 people leave voluntary uh, during that time out of the, I think, the uh, total of about uh, 30 to 40,000 uh, dependents. But again, it, get, it gets at that whole issue of long-term you know, management of these things. So even though the, you know, the information was you know, reassuring for the vast majority of the part, there was still that unknown and, and you know, again, everyone makes their different risk calculation. And, and you can't, despite all your best efforts, you can't necessarily get everybody on board at the same time in these things. So in a case like New York City, like you said, if something happened, voluntary evacuation for those folks who, whose risk tolerance is lower should be an option. And that you facilitate that. You just don't say, hey, you know, you can leave. But the military, I think, did a good job um, in facilitating people who wanted to leave at that point because, you know, they just couldn't. Necessary to deal with the risk calculation as well. Think of you want to. Yeah. Uh, well, I agree with Professor Neva on uh, his presentation. I disagree very much with the ICRP and the IAEA in their lack of plain speakingness about uh, the risk of cancer, solid cancer, and leukemia. If they would only say that uh, for planning purposes, individuals and populations should reckon on a dose response coefficient of 0.05 lethal cancers uh, per person sievert, you would find the population beginning to understand that. But I have long correspondence with the deputy director of the IAEA, Abel Gonzalez, going back to 1997, where they refused to multiply the population dose by the dose response coefficient. And I've had recent uh, correspondence with another member of the ICRP, a Russian, uh, where they also uh, refused to provide such plain information to the public. I think that would be a lot easier than having to dig down in the individual uh, reports, which incidentally are not available free from ICRP except for the 2007 <coughs> report number 111. But it would be very helpful if we had all of these materials, as finally we have from the National Academy of Sciences, all of the reports published by the National Academy Press of government paid for uh, research and evaluations are now available free for download. And I wish that were the case with the United Nations and the International Commission on Radiation Protection. One comment I'd like to make is uh, <clears throat> the concept of risk kind of difficult for any, any of us to understand. So if I get cancer, I get cancer 100%. But when you're talking about the risk, we always use percentage of whatever the fraction of whatever. So you have 10% chance of having cancer. And then this person may I think, you know, one, if he get cancer, okay, I'm this 10%. So, and so, and this is the only way to, to make a link between statistics and uh, individual risk, the, the, the outcome, that is 100% or 0%, is uh, the field of medicine, so medical doctor, if he is a doctor of my cancer treatment, he says, he comes to me, okay, sure, you'll be cured. You have very high chance to survive, even though uh, my chance might be just 10%, 10 less than 10%. He just says that, try to encourage me. And so the, on, the profession to bridge the individual risk and statistic risk is something of the human dimension, which we are not dealing too much at all. So uh, I 100% agree with Dr. Garvin, but at the same time, I'm a little bit cautious about how to use this percentage. So I always bring up 
the reference to in the background really uh, risk fractured so and so. And do you think this much is dangerous to you? And uh, that kind of you know comparison is always uh, be, should be taken so that you really have to make sure that people understand the individual and statistics. And that's my point. I think we have time for one more question. Please. Or comment. Yeah, I'm afraid one thing very much. Uh, although uh, Professor Niva pointed out, maybe 40 years, almost 40 years, we didn't teach radiation. I tried to introduce education of uh, radiation uh, in uh, uh, particularly uh, junior high schools. I failed. Finally, Finally, last year we decided to introduce education radiation in uh, secondary school. But because of this earthquake, again, teachers hate to teach radiation. And also, some, many, many teachers don't know how to teach radiation. <laughs> so, the many years, for me, well, almost 40 years, uh, the particularly teachers, not not particularly science teachers, but uh, mostly uh, teachers of social science. They hate to teach uh, uh, radiation in Japan. So therefore, the uh, people who are working in mass media, they hate also radiation. So the, therefore, the, the, uh, suddenly, every day they hear about uh, Seabird and Becquerel. They don't know what they are. So the how to teach teachers first the importance of radiation and also the dangerous part of radiation. <laughs> and in the, in the, I, I, I wish to ask you, uh, the American, what is American education about? Uh, what do you do in America to teach uh, radiation? I, I, yeah. think, I think the answer is, is in the laughter uh, that there's, there's really essentially nothing. <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. It was a terrific session, and, and thank you very much. Thank you for the informative talk. Uh, Dr. Uh, for Hippel, Dr. Messer, Dr. Gawi, and Dr. Niva. Thank you very much.